rebuilding or reconstructing uh, series uh, of events that SIPE is putting on. We've done one on the role of corporate governance uh, in facilitating the role of constructive capital and the role of integrated compliance uh, in facilitating constructive capital. Now I keep saying that word, constructive capital. What is that all about? Uh, well, uh, a few years ago uh, here at SIPE, we noticed that certain investments uh, taken individually had an additive value uh, above and beyond just simply shareholder returns. Uh, and then taking the collectively, they built up institutions that furthered the rule of law, supported good business practices, uh, and supported the overall development of markets in emerging economies. And so over the, over the past few years, we've been starting to probe this concept about what is constructive capital? Capital itself doesn't really have any agency, right? It's simply a facilitative process. You, you can't tell a good dollar from a da bad dollar. But when capital is invested into a market, there are more things that come with it than just the dollar or the euro investment into that, into that market. Uh, there's a system of values that's attached to that investment uh, by the investors, by the shareholders and the company that's investing into that market. And there's a series of institutions within that market that facilitate or inhibit that, that added value being created by that investment. This is a, the converse of the other topic that we talk about at SIPE of corrosive capital. Uh, corrosive capital are those investments that undermine the rule of law, seek out, seek to build uh, moats uh, through uh, primarily extra legal le means and are, do not really follow the profit motive when they enter a market. And so here at SIPE, we wanna kind of distinguish over the, over, the, over the next few years, what are constructive and facilitative investments to create a good market economy and those that are corrosive to those same market institutions. And I'd, I'd like to, some of my colleagues at SIPE have probably heard me talk about this before, but to use the metaphor of a garden, uh, we've all become uh, a bit of, uh, uh, amateur gardeners here uh, during, uh, during quarantine and lockdown. And if we look at capital as water into our garden, either we can put additional nutrients into that water, or we could conversely put poisonous elements into that water. And so either our garden becomes robust and grows and is fruitful and is plentiful and provides plenty of nutrition and sustenance to everyone, or it withers and dies. Uh, so it's really up to us and the institutions that we build around us uh, and the actors that we choose to engage with. Now, associations are a key element into this process. Professional associations, business associations, chambers of commerce, all of these organizations create rules and norms around which people conduct business around the world every single day. Business associations, the topic of today's focus, uh, is are a key institution within that process and increasingly play a facilitative role in attracting constructive capital that creates good sound market economies. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve Rosalind, who's a deputy director uh, for uh, Middle East and North Africa at the Center for International Private Enterprise. And he's gonna moderate today's discussion. Steve joins us uh, at, at SIPE uh, after several years of, of being a lawyer like myself uh, and is a recovering lawyer at SIPE. We have a small support group. And uh, he also has the CAE designation, Certified Association Executive. Uh, and does quite a bit of work with associations in, in the region, in Middle East and North Africa. And so I'll turn it over to Steve, who will introduce himself and, and the panelists uh, that will be speaking on the path today. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Eric. I think you've, you've covered, um, <clears throat> covered the introduction quite well, quite well, and I appreciate that. Um, and thanks for convening an important and well-timed conversation. Uh, associations have been core partners of SIPES since our uh, founding uh, because of the critical role that they play in representing the business community in the public policy arena in particular. Um, and we've been talking quite a bit recently uh, about the importance of associations in getting the business community through this crisis, 
uh, and leading to recovery and growth on, on the other side of it. Um, and, and so um, I, I think focusing on their role in attracting investment and the right kind of investment uh, through a healthy business uh, and investment enabling environment is, is particularly important. We are um, very pleased to have a distinguished panel joining us today for this um, conversation and I'll introduce them briefly and then we'll get right into the discussion uh, uh, with them. Um, Greta Kotler uh, is a certified association uh, executive uh, and the chief global development and credentialing officer for ASAE, the American Society of Association Executives, which is the credentialing authority for the for the CAE um, and uh, uh, and of which uh, which I am a proud member. Um, she's held that position for the past ten years, um, and prior uh, to that was the chief knowledge and strategy officer for ASAE for for a number of years as well. Uh, and had, um, uh, before her time at ASAE, had spent uh, a number of years with the American Society for Training and Development, so she's a real veteran of the association industry. Um, she holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Wisconsin and a doctorate in education from Virginia Tech. Um, next, we have Dr. Dred Mahasna, who is the chairman of IDAMA Association, uh, the Renewable Energy Association of Jordan. Um, and he is the uh, CEO of uh, Taufik Gargor Shipping Company, a, a, a well-established and renowned uh, shipping company uh, in, in Jordan. He's held various uh, positions of public service and public trust over the years, including uh, the general manager of the Marine Sciences uh, Station in Aqaba, the secretary general of the Aqaba Regional Authority, the director general of Aqaba Ports, uh, and the Secretary General of the Jordan Valley uh, Authority, and he has uh, held teaching positions at, at uh, universities in Jordan as well. He holds a bachelor's uh, from the University of Jordan and a PhD uh, from and postdoctorate from uh, Duke University, where he was also a Fulbright a fellow. Uh, and finally, we're joined by uh, Victor Agallo, who is the head of uh, policy, uh, research analysis, and public-private dialogue with the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, uh, or KEPSA, a, a SIP um, uh, partner in uh, Kenya, which is the, the apex business organization of that country. Uh, and, and Victor, uh, we, we, I know you've been a, a relatively recent uh, substitution in our uh, panel for uh, uh, filling in for one of your colleagues. So if, if I, I don't have your bio handy, so if, if I could ask you to uh, fill in some of the gaps, that would be appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Victor Gallo. Um, I think my colleague was supposed to be in, but uh, she may have mistaken the time to five o'clock. <laughs> so I'm just yeah, stepping in. Yeah, I'm stepping in uh, briefly for her. I was supposed to be in uh, another meeting. That's why I was not able to join. So. I would like to step out at some point before the meeting ends to start the other one. So my name is Victor Gallo. I am an economist. I've worked with the Kenyan government in the Ministry of Planning. Uh, then I've worked with the international NGO called CATS International, Consumer Unity and Trust Society International based in India. I think we have, a, we have an office also in Washington. Um, and now with KEPSA, I have been in different roles. Currently, I'm the head of uh, public policy and uh, PPD. PPD is public private dialogues. Yes, so I've been with KEPSA for seven years, uh, running and managing um, advocacy. Uh, and of course, convening presidential roundtables forums with the, what do you call ministerial stakeholder forums with <laughs> the executive arm of the government. And that has been quite impactful in this country in terms of driving several reforms. Yeah, so. Thank you. That is it briefly for me, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and just a note to our audience as we go, please, um, Please add your questions to our chat uh, uh, feature here. Uh, we'll be monitoring that uh, and, and leave time for plenty of questions in, in exchange with, uh, with, with you as our guests. Um, Greta, I'd like to start with, um, with a question to you. Um, you know, ASAE is the 
Association of Associations <laughs> in the U.S. Uh, and it, with an increasingly global presence as well. So how does ASAE see the role of the association industry in creating a better environment for business and investment? Well, thank you very much, Steve, and good day to everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, you know, briefly answer that question. ASAE also has worked proudly with SIPE for a number of years. I believe it was in 2010, 2011, that we jointly did a study mission from Africa to, to ASAE with a lot of education. And I think we've stayed in touch with many of the uh, colleagues who joined that trip. I also see on the screen that we've been joined by Jeffers Maruka, who is le really leading the African Society of Association Executives. So I wanted to say a welcome and hello to you and, and thank you for being here. This is always great. In terms of ASAE, what I will focus on is a, an initiative that we started over 15 years ago entitled the Power of Associations the power of A, we call it, but it's really about the contribution of associations to society. Now we know that associations make a very important contribution to their industries and professions, but this, this initiative also wanted to showcase the role that associations are playing overall in their societies. And it really focuses on three areas. And one is really very relevant to, I mean, all three are relevant to this conversation, but the first is really to build a stronger economy. And really through industrial development, through product and service innovation, and through you know, it, uh, enabling domestic and international business. And we have many, many examples of this. And the second one, you know, because I also worked at the training and development organization, this one is very important to me, and that's enhancing job skills. We believe that after uh, individuals finish their basic education, that associations play the largest role in continuing education for adults of any other institution, and that is growing. We know that most associations do training and development in their own industry or profession, but the, the amount when you add it all up of the skill development and training that's done by associations is really phenomenal. And I think one thing, you know, when working with the African Society of Association Executives and the Asia Pacific Federation of Association Organizations and European as well, um, it would be good to be able to really definitively track the amount of education and skill development and the impact of that skill development on, on, um, on societies. The third area is really to improve systems and structures, to strengthen lives. We know that associations improve people's lives through volunteerism and also through the creation sometimes of voluntary standards to uplift the industry or, or the profession. And so those three things, building a stronger economy, enhancing job skills, and improving systems and structures are three key areas where associations really facilitate building a stronger society. And as I list these, I think it's important for everyone who's working with associations to begin to think in terms of what is your role? And of course, what are you delivering to your members? And what is your role with your members? But also, what are you doing to help your society, um, to help your society grow, particularly for the context of this um, discussion in, in economic development, which includes both job skills and improving structures. Now, I have some examples of all of these things, but I, I will also, and, and but I want to, uh, you know, bring those back as we as we go through the conversation, so my colleagues have a chance to introduce their their ideas. But I would want to say about ASAE that we're really um, getting ready to celebrate our 100th birthday. Um, so, and you know, with a strong focus on association development. And as my work in, in the international arena, I've just seen enormous development. Obviously, this is a very difficult time for all associations as we go through the pandemic and we're looking at resources, but we believe we will come out stronger and, and more focused and more relevant and 
begin to really be able to track the role that we are playing in our societies. So Steve, congratulations on being a CAE. This is important too. Um, and, and that's a program that we're actually working you know, on, on enabling more globally. So thank you. And I've got examples when we, when we want them, but I'll pass on now to let my colleagues have a chance to speak. Thanks, Greta, and, and congratulations on the centennial um, <laughs> of ASAE, and what a what a year to be marking that milestone. Right, um, Victor, I, I'd like to I'd like to come to you next. You know, as a as a um, uh, an apex business uh, federation in 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 Kenya, um, what role does Kepsa play in attracting? investment and specifically the the sort of constructive capital as we as we call it that we're talking about today thanks a lot um there's a lot you can say about this um but as an apex body that uh, drives advocacy in kenya uh, leading to reforms in the business environment reforms in uh, setting up business, uh, operating business, and of course, attracting investments. We play a huge role in terms of supporting government to achieve its national development agenda. We partner with the government on national development projects. Right now we have, um, we have uh, uh, an, an agenda called Big Four. I don't know whether you know it. Big Four are four main items that the current regime is focusing on. Of course, with the interruption of Corona, uh, but we are focusing our national development agenda on manufacturing, on uh, food security, on uh, universal health, and uh, affordable housing. All these are investment opportunities. Um, the development goals driven by the government, but in partnership with the private sector. So we lead in the process of distilling um, information that we can share with our members um, that are relevant for investment purposes. Uh, and, and at times we also look at what policy work or reform work may need to be put in place in order to anchor the, the, the national development agenda. So we look at how can we do all this together? Uh, where do we get the resources from? Uh, which regulations may need to be tweaked a little bit to support the agenda? And we point all those out and, and, and continuously we monitor uh, the uptake of all these development programs. Uh, we monitor the, 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 the uptake, we report at the highest level, that's the presidential roundtable, which we normally have twice in a year. Uh, and then in the course of the year, after every presidential roundtable, a lot of work then gets done at the ministerial level, the MDS, the ministries, departments and agencies um, that are supposed to take um, to implement directives, either directives that have been issued at the presidential level. So we help in tracking all this and, 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 and keeping the government in check. And of course, we also um, lead business delegations um, to promote the opportunities that are in Kenya. So we lead business delegations inbound and outbound uh, uh, in trying to sell the opportunities that are here in the country, but also uh, linking our members with potential partners outside. Yeah, so those are some of the things that uh, we do, and uh, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, positive reforms that have have been. Uh, we've had here, as, uh, you know, courtesy of Kepsa's uh, uh, convening power um, on advocacy. And of course, we've worked with SIP um, for many years, I think since 2009. Um, in, and, and by the way, SIP has really, really strengthened Kepsa's advocacy capacity, uh, both in terms of offering training to our board members, supporting us to develop what you call national business agenda. And it is, it's, it's within this agenda that we advocate to government. So, 
Saif has been very, very helpful in terms of um, training us uh, even on how to develop a national business agenda. And this is something that um, the president was so proud of uh, because it helped him to anchor his first to anchor his first uh, um, to anchor his first term in 2013 up to 2018 up to 2017, and our national business agenda was embedded into uh, as as part of uh, you know the contracts to the different ministries, what you call performance contracts. But you have to you have to deliver this because the businesses want it, and it is a book that the president can refer to, and he kept reading it. Where are we at on this particular agenda that you wanted? Yeah, so that is the beauty of um, uh, developing an agenda that then becomes a reference book that you can use and uh, and 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 market the country. Thanks a lot. Thank you, and I, think I, should, add, I should add to that that you know the the Kebsa, uh national business agenda is a is an excellent example on a model that you, we we now use at SIPE in different countries around the world to help our society uh, undertake a similar establish a similar advocacy platform. It's very it's very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dorade, I, I'd like to turn to you now, um, and and. To hear about the Jordanian experience, you know, Idema represents um, an industry um, in which international investment uh, and international business relationships are particularly important. Um, so, you know, how do you how do you attract that level of uh, investment and engagement in a way that promotes healthy, well functioning uh, energy markets in Jordan and serves Jordan's interests? Thank you. I, I let me first explain or uh, thank you very much for hosting me today. I'm glad to be among people like yourself, Greta, Victor, and uh, and Eric, and with all this distinguished audience uh, group. Uh, this was a unique example, and uh, probably Greta started laying the ground on constructive uh, or say positive. Uh, 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 investment in that sense. What is constructive to me and to many people in Jordan is things that would lead to better, uh, uh, better socioeconomics, uh, more gains on that level. Idama for one means sustainability in Arabic. That's the word in Arabic, and and sustainability can only be maintained or gained if we combine the three factors: water, environment, and energy. We had to push the government, say, in awareness, advocacy, or at least provoke them towards using renewable energy for all purposes instead of conventional energy. Governments tend to use conventional energy because they gain more taxes out of conventional energy. And it's more lucrative for them for the budget uh, than rather for the, for the whole uh, integrated form of health and well-being and socioeconomic gains. In that form, uh, probably in the year 2004, 2005, I was part of a small group of business people, uh, environmentalists and, and many who gathered to, to build up, uh, to start IDAMA as an association. And with the help and support of uh, uh, the Jordanian King, King Abdullah and the government, uh, let me put it this way, we came to, uh, to formalize the first strategy, energy strategy, that enabled us to introduce renewable energy into the country. In 2010, we embarked on an investment scheme for renewable energy, and we did so much of investment in renewable energy that we gained, uh, uh, I mean, investment from abroad of over $2 billion in renewable energy. This is still modest, though the figure is, uh, seems in billions, but we only comprise 4% of the energy production in Jordan. And that, to me, that is extremely poor. What I would wish to see 10%, 20% in, in 20 years, 30%, and so on. And uh, what I would like to see that people would gain out of renewable energy, because it's cheap. The price of renewable energy, I mean, uh, energy electricity produced from rene renewable energy compared to conventional 
does not exceed 5%. So guys, why don't we do that? Now, we have to use that renewable energy in different forms. One particular reason is Jordan is one of the poorest countries on earth in terms of water. And that's not only because we don't have big rivers and so much of rainfall, we have adequate rainfall, but that's simply because demographic shifting in the region pushed Jordan to increase in population. We were 250,000 in 1940, 1948, a man was 248, uh, uh, 250,000. Now in one year, because of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, war and the occupation of Palestine and the creation of Israel, we had refugees of so much that doubled the number of, of people in Amman. Then the figure doubled because of the Iraqi war. And then the figure doubled lately because of the Syrian war. Uh, because of Syria, we, we received more than 15% of the population in, turn, in, in the form of Syrian refugees. We have now 1.4 million Syrian refugees in Jordan that we have to feed and give water for all purposes. Now, take in consideration that this is a country that has enough water only for 2 million, yet we have 11 million. How can we adapt to that? Unless we introduce renewable energy for extraction of water, purification of water, and sending water from one area to another, then definitely we would have catastrophe in terms of health as well as living standards. Yet we are surviving very well, and we're pushing that, that number of 4% in energy production would be 10% and 20% by the year 2030. We are at the moment discussing uh, with the government there or reviewing the uh, lately the proposed or discussed uh, uh, strategy for energy. Uh, we produced ours. We do uh, constitute actually a big push power for, for gaining more on the environmental level. What I would like to see that transportation that consumes or that produces 45% of the pollution in the streets of Jordan is less than that. So that's where energy, or where, that's where environment and energy also combine to produce the best. That fragile ecosystem that we have in Jordan cannot be done only by the government. That's why we as uh, IDAMA produce that big business association, and we have all the energy developers in it. We have bankers in it. We have all telecommunications, and we have industry and tourism. Uh, tourism and industry are gaining ground in Jordan, and, they, and we, we have increasingly more tourists coming to Jordan. But we want these tourists to be, I mean, treated in an environmental way. I want the electricity they use in their rooms to be produced by renewable energy. And that is, that is a multiple gain for not only for the tourists, but also for the provider of the room, whether the hotel or whoever, because then he can pro pro provide a cheaper room rate, which would benefit all. Now, uh, having said that, I, I also would allow others to, to, gain, uh, to engage in more questions, but uh, we did, uh, we had a very big crisis like the rest of the world. And I only here to wish all of the people all around the world. Uh, and suddenly we find ourselves united to fight COVID-19, whether in the States, in Brazil, in, uh, in the Far East, China and the Middle East. This is a major global enemy for us all. And unless we have clean energy, clean attitude towards every single resource, whether air, uh, water, and uh, we, we do deal more rationally with the natural resources, we would definitely be in, in a worse situation. So the thing is, let's unite for more constructive approach to all these matters. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Duraid, and thank you for uh, raising the, uh, the issue of the uh, coronavirus pandemic crisis. I mean, we can't ignore the the reality of the pandemic crisis and the uh, global economic downturn that has um, that it has precipitated today, um, and that we're all dealing with. Um, I think within the past couple of weeks, the the IMF has forecast a 
uh, 4.9 uh, percent economic contraction uh, globally this year. Uh, and so with that, the need to attract uh, international investment becomes all the more critical to get our respective economies back on a, on a path towards growth. So I, I, Victor, question for you here. Um, you know, KEPSA is, is working from a comprehensive economic response framework to the uh, pandemic crisis. Um, it, it's a very good model. Uh, again, one that we've referenced in our, in our work and with other uh, partners. And one of the things that I really love about it is the um, inclusion of private sector ac actions and commitments in addition to you know, what you're asking from the government. It's as much about how the private sector is going to show uh, leadership here and, and what you're offering. So can you tell us a little bit more about this and how, how it's fundamentally focused on, how your agenda is fundamentally focused on, on uh, you know, not, not just recovery and growth for its own sake, but doing it in the right way that balances various interests and promotes uh, business ethics on one side and good governance in the public space. Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks again on that. Um, basically, there's something we learned, um, we've learned over the years, and this is the lag in the public sector to take action. This is usually what you call a policy lag. Um, because the process of organizing a whole government system to respond um, from the public sector side, that's normally a little bit slower. And we were able to galvanize uh, support of many of our partners to start off the discussion on a potential response strategy to COVID um, early in March. Actually, I did a survey end of end of February that then we released in March, and that began that that's what be, be, uh, helped us to begin the conversation and the, the, the government really found it uh, quite befitting to, to to refer to and it became the basis of further conversations that we then had with different ministries before the government could organize itself we already had a proposal of potential interventions so it made it made their work very very easy and with before a month's time, the president already called us to present the same to him. And he then instructed for action across different departments and said, I'm going to make these announcements myself. Right. So we are balancing economy. We 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 were also urging businesses to be very, very uh, empathetic with with their employees. And, you know, this, this is really not the time to send people home, to fire people, but this is the time to stand with them as a business. Uh, your employees have been working very hard and uh, are the source of your growth. You know, when, when the time was good, now that there's a crisis, it's actually the best time to stand with them and show some empathy. Um, so we gave different models on how jobs could be retained. And um, even for businesses that are not able to retain their jobs, we also did a survey to find out which ones would be firing people in the next two weeks, one month, and what is it that we could do that we could ask government to do for businesses to retain their employees. So that's what, that's, that, that led to a raft of, uh, 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 recommendations and uh, actions that we saw on the front of VAT, uh, we saw on the front of um, um, banking, the financial sector, uh, that the, the CBR rate was reduced. We worked together with the, with the central bank governor on that. VAT was reduced. Um, pay, the, the pay was also um, stopped for a cadre of people earning a certain amount of money, all right, so that there could be more disposable income uh, into the people's pockets to keep them running, it, to keep running the economy, and but also to keep them afloat. It's really the worst time that uh, um, 
we needed to stand up and we, we, we saw what I would call the human side of businesses, right? As a result of our interventions. And the president liked it that we were actually conscious about retaining jobs at a time when most other businesses in other countries, just by a small flicker of a trigger, would send people home and fire them. But we worked on a retention strategy that has actually helped cushion a lot of businesses. And so it was a give and take. The government then said, okay, if you're going to retain these guys and this is what you want from us, we are, we are, we are ready and willing to, uh, to give businesses whatever they're asking for so that they can actually uh, retain jobs. Um, so every week, every week, we actually used to meet twice a week and it's just until the last month that we now turned it down to weekly meetings. Every week now we meet to review our progress and report back to government. Uh, where are we lagging at? What is the, the impact of the actions that have been taken by government, for instance? So we give feedback. So we're in a feedback loop mechanism where we, we, we also respond back to government and say, you gave us all these incentives to support businesses. And so far, this is how we are progressing. And this has been the impact so far. So it keeps a very positive uh, uh, relationship between business and government. And this is a model that um, uh, a, a number of, uh, a number of uh, researchers have actually called to interview me on how, how, how did you do it? How, how, how could you get um, government, basically our work became then the, the, the tool for the government to implement. Yeah. Thank you excellent, so much. Excellent example of private sector leadership uh, and a solution uh, orientation to the, to the whole crisis. And, and it's, it's, it's really great to see that, that level of, uh, of engagement and, and, and leadership. And the um, the balancing of the the, the respective interests that you've that you've done in in your advocacy program. It's not just about business interests, but how the success of business will also serve um, uh, larger societal uh, interests um, and economic well being. Um, Duraid uh, Idama has also um, issued a position paper um, on for the renewable energy sector um, in the COVID-19 crisis. And I just want to paraphrase or quote briefly from that. It says, the COVID-19 crisis has uh, given the concepts of self-reliance and energy security new dimensions that cannot be ignored during or after the crisis. And we see possibilities that they uh, contribute to the energy portfolio management and appropriately attract local and global investments during this critical period. How so? Actually, this goes both ways. One, in terms of security, uh, you can only depend on local, naturally gained uh, energy resource, like the solar energy or wind energy. Once all imports from outside, we import 94% of our energy resources from outside. And those might, might erupt, whether it's COVID-19, wars in, in 2010, uh, terrorists used to bomb uh, a pipeline uh, transmitting gas from Egypt to both Jordan and Israel. And then we, we ended up uh, buying fuel, which was more expensive and incurring heavy losses. Now, in, in that case, in, in the COVID-19, lately the crisis, there was tremendous pressure on sectors like the health sector. Now, I would gain and the health sector would gain so much of support if energy provided to that sector is from solar or environmentally driven resources, then rather conventional. First of all, this is cheaper and this is cleaner. And while transportation was almost zero at one, uh, some days because there's, uh, there was a total lockdown, uh, we have seen that even the environment improved. So, uh, uh, the Idama's call was, uh, it's time that you think of re, uh, I mean, re-strategizing your plans. We were calling the government as well as the people that please put more emphasis on clean energy. Let, let them 
Let that clean energy guide you towards what is better and constructive and healthy. Uh, sectors like telecommunication. We are now uh, communicating through a telecommunication system. Why should I make that sector suffer by asking them to pay for higher bills of energy? I should provide environmentally clean energy and cheap one for, for, uh, for the, and that's exactly the constructive that Greta started, you started talking about and Eric and all of us. That's the constructive. That's why we find out. Now, there is an example that I love in terms of constructive, and it's not only in making money. One of my sons was doing a research in, in a very poor area called the, uh, the Jordan Valley, uh, and it's an area that extends from the Dead Sea, for those who can imagine the geography, to the Red Sea. Temperatures there are soaring head, uh, high. In, in summer, they reach 48, 45, and so on. And he noticed that none of the students, elementary school students, pass their general exam, their general certificate exam, to enable them to go to universities. And simply because students used not to go to schools, I mean, to classrooms. Classrooms were enormously hot. They couldn't stay there. And teachers, too. What we did, what Idama did, is we started gain, I mean, producing some support from different companies, engaging different companies for air conditioning some of these schools on solar energy. Now, the schools started to produce that energy without really paying high bills. And we, we did something like 13 schools for that, and we got awarded uh, from a European Council on that. That's where you, you really integrate what you believe in, in terms of financial gains, as well as social gains towards producing a better society. We went ahead and even distributed that to churches and mosques and where people gather more. And luckily we noticed that students did pass the exam because they even they even stayed after school in that uh, classroom because it's cooler and it's uh, it's nice to stay in and and if you produce that not only to schools to health centers in the same area and social gathering uh, i mean uh, halls where people have their weddings and so on you are not only helping you are upgrading the level of or the standard of living in people and that's why associations are for you can you can definitely gain in good manners and good production, and at the same time, have have uh, introduced facilities or uh, commodities that that are accessible in a good manner for people. Excellent examples of of the role that associations can play in facilitating construction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Greta, I, I'd like to turn to you. I know you had some exam some other examples that you wanted to share, and, and we'd welcome um, uh, we'd welcome those as well. And also to um, to, to ask you to you know consider um, how the role of uh, organized business is so important in um, and the, the role of associations as uh, as representatives of the business community is so important. Um, at this time more than ever, but you know we're also challenged uh, as, a, as a community, as an industry to do that in different ways. So you know, are, have you seen the crisis changing the way that associations do business in the long term? And what trends in the industry have been um, accelerated perhaps or even reversed because of this crisis? Well, thank you so much. And I wanted to say for Victor and DeRay, it, the examples, I, you know, were just absolutely fantastic, both in terms of the role of associations, the role with the relationship and partnership with government. I think also the, the role of advocacy within associations. And I think just to start, you know, we look at associations as providing four major things. That is, you know, education or learning knowledge community, but also advocacy. And I think the role of advocacy and working with the government does vary from country to country around the world. Some countries don't allow it at all. But to go back, I'll give you one, one example that I think is interesting. It's, you know, it, it won't be in as much detail as the examples that we've just heard, but it's the Korea International Trade Association. 
And, you know, through, and this is a, a pre-COVID example, so we'll have to see how they're doing, you know, during COVID and post-COVID, but their, their focus was uh, on a competition that they needed in the small and, and medium-sized business enterprises. Um, so they, they felt that they were not competitive in those areas. The younger people were not joining in these, in these industries. And so what they did is they created, you know, what many associations do, they created an academy, a trade academy to prepare the younger um, generation to trade both individually and within their companies so that they became more competitive. And I think they were very successful in that. They, they help both the individuals, the, the younger people to have more solid jobs, but also the industry itself in small and medium sized businesses to be more competitive. So, so that, that's one example. Um, another example is probably within Australia where they have a, a very strong engineering um, profession, but there were many um, migrants who were not able to follow the same standards because they weren't included in the um, in the in the listing of, of professional engineers. So they really worked with government to to resolve this problem to make sure that the education of uh, engineers outside of Australia was included in the national registry, and in that way they were able to both help. The, the society that needed more engineers as well as the individuals. Now, in terms of what associations, you know, where they fit in all of this, I mean, this has been a very difficult period for all associations. Um, we have what, what ASAE itself has done is many virtual sessions like this one, always at no cost up to this point. And I think that's true of so many associations and that at some point we have to figure out a new business model. And I think that's what is really on top of mind today is what is the business model that will help associations move forward during COVID and post COVID. Now we have several it, you know, associations depend so much, and this is very true in the US and around the world, and it's very, very true of ASAE itself, depends on, you know, classroom education, in-person education, and all of a sudden that's not even possible for, for much of the world, although, you know, different parts of the world are opening up in different ways. So I think one, one impact of all this is how do we do education in the future? How do we do virtual education? Now, ASAE itself has a, you know, a, a, what we consider large, a five to 6,000 person annual meeting every year. This year, it's in August. It's always in August. It has been in August for most of those 100 years. Well, this year, you know, it, it had to go all virtual. It was in Las Vegas. There was no way for people to travel in. There was no way to really do it. So it's all virtual. And at first we struggled with, okay, what would the fee be? And in the end, we're making it free for all members, which is really great because members will now be able to attend and a very low cost for non-members. And I think that's the kind of thing that associations are really dealing with. I, to me, it's not returning to normal. There is no returning to normal. The question is, what is the new way? We call it the new normal, but what is the new way that associations will continue to flourish, but also have a business proposition for themselves? Now we meet with, we have several small groups and I'm constantly meeting with CEOs of, of, of organizations, particularly those that do a lot of global work within their associations. And they're pretty much facing the same things. I, I appreciated Victor's role with government and keeping anybody from, or, or cre creating structures whereby people would not be um, furloughed during this time. But the associations are looking at how do they, how do they get to the post COVID period stronger, more relevant to their members? What do they give up? What do they start? And I, and I think the virtual training is, is, an, is an example because we had one group from an engineering society that said that, that had been on their radar for a long time. And then all of a sudden with COVID, they were able to get rid of all obstacles to it and now are doing a very strong uh, global, global engineering training around the world. So those are some examples. I think you know it's very important for associations to share their stories. I think the African Society and the Asia Pacific Society are very important to looking at this regionally. And if we can gather the stories 
regionally, um, I think we can also gather the story globally of the role, the important role of associations. So I see a positive future, but not without a lot of hurdles for people to go through and rethinking of their business model and their, their contribution to society and their role of contribution to their own members. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience and I, I would um, uh, again um, uh, urge people, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box or raise, use the raise hand uh, feature uh, to let us know that you have a question. This one is from Michael uh, Fiadzigbe, if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly, uh, for Victor. Um, uh, Michael has, has uh, pointed out there's so much government can do to stimulate uh, private sector activity uh, like reducing uh, uh, pay as you earn, VAT, et cetera. Um, but how can government keep its head above the water when it also depends on the private sector for taxes uh, and, and other sources of revenue? Victor, that one's for you. Hello, Victor. Yes, hi. Hi. Yeah, I was struggling. I was struggling with, with unmuting myself. Okay, I think we have the wrong, I think we have the wrong Victor there. <laughs> oh, okay. Victor from, from Kepsa. Yes. Oh, th okay. This is you. <laughs> Hello, Victor. I suggest you go to another question, uh, uh, Steve, until yes. Victor is back. It looks like we had a, a, a glitch there. Well, uh, Dorado, I'll come back to you. I mean, how has your um, advocacy work? Um, you know, and your advocacy outlook changed in light of this crisis and, um, you know, what challenges are, are presenting themselves uh, uh, to you in that? And also, not just on the advocacy front, but um, I'm curious about membership too. You know, is membership a, is membership a tougher sell in this, in this environment or have you found ways to sort of enhance the value proposition uh, in, in the midst of all of this? I think that this is a this is an unprecedented crisis. Both financially, yes, definitely, many of the members are reluctant to pay. We had the problem of uh, how much to pay the employees, the staff members. We kept them on salaries, and that that really really was hard to do because we were not gaining support. But uh, I I must tell you, we gained a lot of moral support from the public. We are now more, uh, uh, people are paying us more attention. Uh, people are looking more towards environmental solutions. And there is a tremendous donor society in the form of uh, foreign donations, whether uh, organizations from the US, whether governmental or uh, Canadian, uh, German and uh, European. Uh, or, uh, no, we are well supported. Now, I cannot say for the rest of the community because it's not, it, it doesn't depend only on us. Uh, most of our business uh, partners uh, are under uh, scrutiny, financial scrutiny, situation is, is not easy. So I cannot pretend that all things are normal. In terms of advocacy, say, or, uh, or pushing our message further, no, we have gained a lot of support. And I think the whole world would change their attitudes towards uh, the environment after COVID-19. It's not the same. Uh, and allow me, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm usually very political, and but I'm not insinuating anything towards anything. Conservative systems had found more difficulty in dealing with the COVID-19 than really open systems, whether politically, economically, and cross-border uh, policies. Uh, that that is something we must learn of, and Idama is trying their, their best to open up to all facilities and people around. We're trying to help, 
And we, we are engaged even with the government. One of the things that the government couldn't do was really cut uh, uh, bills for energy producers from the private sectors. And most of these developers are EDAMA members. So we intervened to really find a way that that uh, that uh, would mend defenses between the two parties at that uh, where while developers had to wait a bit the government would have to pay later on so you can always uh, really mend if you mean well you can always do the good thing thank you very much and with that we're we're almost out of time um and pending any other uh questions that we, that we may have. Uh, I think I'll, I'll turn it back over to Eric, who has uh, hosted us for the conversation this morning for any parting thoughts. But special thanks to all of our panelists for sharing your expertise and insights. I think, you know, the goal here was to have um, a few very diverse viewpoints from uh, around the globe from our, our, our partner network. Um, and, and we've certainly brought that and, and, and great success stories and examples of, of um, the role that you're playing in attracting constructive capital, and particularly in this very difficult economic um, environment that we're all that we're all facing. So, thank you once again for your insights, and thank you to our our the participation today. But Eric, I'll turn it back over to you so that we can be sure to close on time. Thank you, Steve. I uh, really appreciate your moderating the panel today, and uh, thank you to the excellent panelists. Where we have examples from the ASAE from South Korea. Uh, partners there. We've got examples uh, from Kenya and, and, and what they're doing uh, to constructively engage with uh, the government to find real concrete solutions uh, that move the ball forward. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dorit, for your uh, additions uh, from the Jordanian perspective. And the, uh, the example that'll stick with me is uh, getting uh, that investment into, uh, into Jordan. Uh, which is, you know, checks all of the boxes uh, in terms of, of environmental sustainability and improving educational outcomes. And at the same time, you're, you're creating a, a more conducive environment and showing the government how to do this. How It's, it's not just a fantasy. It's not just a, an everyone wins utopia, utopial scenario. It's real. It's concrete. You can touch it. You can feel it. And that's what, at, at the end of the day, that's what we're, gonna, we're trying to talk about uh, is constructive solutions, provided by associations. At the same time, throughout this, this discussion today, uh, we've noticed that I hear the same uh, pattern repeating itself. Everywhere, associations are under threat uh, from their funding models and from their business models. Uh, and Greta, I really think, put a great point on this uh, in terms of we have to find a way to do business differently because associations are so instrumental in facilitating this constructive dialogue to provide uh, a great ecosystem, which gives more people more opportunity and provides constructive solutions to governments. And it, it provides a great partnership between the private sector and government. So with that, thank you again to all the panelists. Thank you again to Steve for moderating. Uh, and we hope to continue the dialogue uh, on Facebook uh, on and all the other social media platforms uh, where we're engaged. Have a great Monday morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. So. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Eric. you so much.